So thank you for joining us this morning. Those of you that's joining us online, uh, it's, it's such a privilege for us to be able to still be able to, to worship and to fellowship together. And as you know, as a church, we've been going through Acts as a series, and I want to continue this morning. But it is so hard, you know, to, to kind of follow up on, on the preach at the Pentecost, you know. Um, Frank shared a beautiful message, Nikki shared before that, just what the Acts is truly about. So this morning, I want to continue at the back end, and we're going to be looking at Acts 2 um, from verse, uh, sorry, Acts 2 from verse 22. But before I get to that, so if you want to turn with your Bibles, uh, with me in your Bibles, to get yourself ready for that. So, of course, what's happening here in Acts, this is basically where the Holy Spirit came upon the people, and, uh, you know, people started speaking in tongues, and everyone else was um, able to understand, um, you know, what they were saying. And what we see from the reaction of the people that was there is that their minds were blown. How is it possible that all of this can happen, that people speak in the language so that they could understand what was said? So imagine there's this, there's how many different cultures here, how many different languages. So remember the Holy Spirit come upon us and we are each able to understand what the other one is saying. I was like, no for you, you know, say, my you for star, next what they say. I was just speaking my own language, right? So imagine you could understand what I was saying. Minds would be blown. And this is exactly what's happened here. Their minds was blown by what they've seen and what they've heard. Again, this is about the Holy Spirit doing what the Holy Spirit does. Remember Jesus said that once he die, he will leave someone in return. And that was really the promise of the Holy Spirit. And what we've seen and what we have experienced here and what they've experienced here is truly the Holy Spirit just showing himself. And that for me is just a glimpse of what was to come. But I want to, before I read the scripture, I just want to pray for us. And I want to ask God just to be with us. And as we share this word, that it will truly find, you know, root in, 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 our, in our hearts this morning. So God, we just, we just come before you this morning. And we just want to give you praise and honor for who you are, Father. Lord Jesus, we just want to explain and just say to you this morning that we love you. And we just so appreciate what you've done on that cross for us. We thank you again also for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Where you, when you said, Father, that when the Holy Spirit come upon us, that we will be able to do greater things than what Jesus did when he was walking on this earth. And this morning as we share this word, Father, I pray that as I share this, Father, that you truly speak to me. Everything that is in my notes that is not of you, I pray that you would remove it. And everything that is, is there, Father, I pray that we would honestly and be able to apply this in our lives. Father, we give you all the praise and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I said, this is at the back end of, of the, the Holy Spirit coming upon people, the different tongues, the different languages. And, and here their minds have been blown, right? But you know what happens there is it doesn't stop there. So all of this has happened. And Peter decided, well, actually, I've got your attention now already. So let me blow your minds even more. All right? So the tongues was amazing. So he decides he's going to blow their minds more. And he, st he starts reading the scripture for them. And he starts talking about this. He says, men of Israel, here's these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourself known. In other words, if they have seen for themselves. And I shared that example. And I mean, I can share many examples of when, when God did amazing things through Jesus. For example, when he fed the 5,000, how many people got saved? At once. And that's just one experience. Um, Frank shared about, you know, when, uh, when this young man was raised up from the dead. How many people do you think got saved? Just from that one story. And we can go on and on just about talking about these different acts and miracles that Jesus did. So minds would be blo were blown. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. So God raised him up, losing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at the right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, 
And this is where, where he quotes Psalm 16, right? So he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about this patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath on to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the res resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. This Jesus God raised up. And of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourself are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. What a powerful scripture and what a powerful quote this is that, I, that was used um, in, this, uh, in this passage. Now, everything that God does, I just want to remind you, everything that God does, even in your own lives today, is planned. It is not nilly-willy. God knows exactly what he's doing, just like he did with Jesus. He knew exactly what the plan was. The plan was Jesus was the symbol of salvation. Am I right? And maybe we don't agree with the method that was used, you know, for that, for him to be crucified. It is actually quite cruel. But at the end of the story is this. It was all planned. The Bible says it was in the foreknowledge of God. Right? Because it's all got to do with the salvation plan. But Peter speaks about three, a couple of things here. The first one is the life of Jesus Christ. He speaks about the crucifixion. And then he touched on the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. So let's look at the life and purpose of Jesus. The, this scripture, it starts off by, the, sorry, verse 22, it starts off by saying, he said, Jesus was approved and attested. So what that means is that there's an approval from God. And he proved it by the miracles that he's done through Jesus Christ on earth. You and I, we've got our own stories. You and I, we've got our own miracles. You and I, we've got our own testimonies of things that God has done in our lives. Right? So, again, in our own lives, these, the, he's been attested. He's been approved. That's why you and I are able to stand here today. Okay? So, he's done those miracles to prove to them, and he proved to them, this man is indeed of God. Even the story that Frank sh shared with us this morning, Lazarus was raised. Who else have authority over death? No one else but Jesus. No one else but God. I'm, guys, I'm telling you, there's so many stories and so many uh, attestations of, of what God has done or what he's doing right here. So he's done that through many, many miracles. And I shared with you already, you know, so many people got saved through different stories, 3,000, 5,000. And sometimes it's even over only one. Remember the story of the man that was, that was um, abandoned to an island because he was demon-possessed and he was just chased. And then he, he healed him. And Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone. But what did he do? He went and he, he actually told people. Although God only had the privilege of sharing that with one, that's all that was needed because that man then went and shared that story with so many others. We need to start sharing the stories that God is doing in our own lives. Right? You might think that you are going through tough times, that you're going through difficult times. But when you look back and you see God is actually the one that is carrying you through, people start telling the stories. We can't always go on the miracles of yesterday. But let's go and share the miracles of today. Let's go and share the testimonies of today. Let's not be quiet about what God has done in our lives. Because it's in that way that, that again, that we show that God is truly an amazing God. A Father that loves us. The Father that shows us uh, amazing grace, like we're saying this morning. So, again, this, this was quite convincing when, when Jesus showed him, I am truly the Son of God. So many people were saved. Um, and he obviously offended many people by doing so. And that's part of the reason they end up wanting to crucify him, and which they've done. Okay, so the second point is the crucifixion. Like I shared with you already, is this was God's fixed plan from the beginning. All right? So, yes, it might have been cruel. And uh, for those of you that don't know, that the crucifixion was actually one of the cruelest punishments for the cruelest 
kind of um, criminals. And it was always done publicly. And it was with severe pain and severe agony. And by doing so, this crucifixion, it just shows you that our God is willing to do anything and everything for you and I. Even sacrifice his son on the cross for you and I. And we need to start, we need to learn to put our trust in him with everything. God did that for us. That amazing grace that we're saying about this morning, he did that for us. But one thing that I want to assure you is this. It was all part of God's plan. God might be taking you through different journeys, through different challenges, through different moving you around. Frank, bless you, Bishop. Okay? But God might be moving you around from place to place. But that is all part of God's plan and purpose for your life. It doesn't, might not make sense to us, but it makes sense to him. God doesn't do things nilly-willy. He's had it planned, organized for our, for our salvation. Okay. Um, remember the crucifixion. Sorry, I shared that already. So what happened was, obviously, Jesus, God needed a sinless person, a spotless lamb. And that's what Jesus was. And that's why he sacrificed his own son. Because that's the only perfection. That's the only spotless lamb that we could get that would be enough for us. All part of his plan. If Jesus was not crucified, it means there would be no resurrection. And would, what would that mean to us? It would be completely then pointless. It's like, if there's, no, if there's no crucifixion, if there's no resurrection, what is half of the Bible about? Because that is truly the basis of our faith of, as Christians, right? That is our salvation. Because if it wasn't for that, you and I would not be here. And we need to understand and recognize that. If it wasn't for that, you and I would not be here. All part and plan of, God, of God's purpose and his foreknowledge. All right? So, it is planned. his plan was well executed. And we need to trust him even with our own lives, with our own plans that he's placed in our heart. Proverbs 16 verse 9 says, For man make up for we make our plans, but God is the one that ultimately directs it. Where are you? Are you trusting God with your life? Are you trusting him with the plan that he set out for you? Right? All right. So the third one that I want to touch on is the resurrection. And this is, they start in verse 24. He says, this is where he honestly blew their minds. He said to them, this God that you crucified, Listen, he's not there anymore. All right? He's not there anymore. You can go check for yourself. We've had several witnesses, but go check for yourself if you want to. He's not there. And to me, this is such a powerful, powerful piece. Jesus said this about himself. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that this would happen. It was prophesied that he will rise from the dead. You know, we quote this scripture about in Psalms, it was about David. And we, we know that David, when he was talking about this, when he was writing this, even as Paul quoted this, David, he wasn't talking about himself. Because the scripture says that, that they know where the tomb of David was. So it was still there. This is what the Bible teaches, it was still there. So he was, David was definitely not referring to himself. He was referring in prophecy to, to the Messiah that's to come. And I found this very interesting that, that he uses this as a psalm. You know, he quotes this psalm. And the reason for that is he knew exactly who he was talking to. It says that you, men of Israel, who were the men of Israel? It was the Jews, right? But he wasn't, it obviously not just the Jews, it was also Gentiles that was among them, the people that was responsible because he addressed them. But just like our God, he knows that he, whatever he quotes, it needs to be relevant to the people around him. All right? So that's why he quoted that. And he said to them, but this Jesus that you crucified is not in the cross. It's not in the tomb anymore. And like I said earlier on, guys, that, that resurrection is truly the basis of our Christian walk. Most scriptures refer to this. Churches were planted and based on this, that resurrection. Because if it didn't happen, there would be a problem. Okay? <clears throat> Alright. So all of this needed to happen for two reasons. The first reason is this. Because God required Jesus to rise from the dead. We sang that song earlier on as well. It says, uh, well, before, not, not today maybe, but we sang the song, but well, death could not hold him. Why is that? 
Because God has given him victory over death. And for God's plan and purpose to be fulfilled, we needed that. Because otherwise, again, everything that happened in the past would be useless. Okay? The second reason is this. So that prophecy could be fulfilled. Old Testament as prophecies. New Testament is prophecies fulfilled. And we see lots of examples of it. And this is just another reason why Christ had to be why Christ had to rise from the dead. And that's again for our uh, salvation. It's part of God's salvation plan for us. Um, then it's, we I want to carry on, and we just want to just want to make one reference here. And this is the last one. So, in fact, the resurrection of Christ is the central message of the Christian Church and the cornerstone content of our witness in the world. Without Christ's resurrection, there is no Christ return. And if this, all of this didn't happen, guys, there would be no hope for you and I. You and I would have no hope. You and I would be exposed to death, eternal death. But because of what God, in that, what God did on that cross by sacrificing his son, Jesus Christ, there is hope for us. There is salvation for us. And even with the scripture that we just read as well, that Frank shared on last week, if it wasn't for this, there would be no Holy Spirit. So can you see how things that was prophesied has come to pass through this, through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ? And the word says this, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, that's verse 22, shall be saved. And guys, without all of this, without the life, without the death, without the resurrection, there would be no life for us. That is our salvation. That is what this Jesus did for us. So that you and I can be saved one day. Many of us might be going through tough times. And like Frank said, Frank might as well preach the message this morning. Is, you know, we go through difficult times. We think this is the moment in the time where God is, that we feel that, you know, God has neglected us. He's left us alone. But I want to encourage you this. Because again, the Bible teaches us this. It says that God will never leave us nor forsake us. Again, part of his plan. If it was, if this is the story, right? When Jesus Christ was on the cross, what did he say? He says, Father, if this is in your will, take this cup away from me. And he could have done that quite easily, right? He could have done that. But he knew if he did that, all of it would be for nothing. All of it would be for nothing. Everything, every step was planned. It was so that you and I one day can be re reunited with our Father in heaven. And it's the same thing that has happened here. With Jesus, he's sitting there at the right hand side of the Father, interceding for you and I. Now, I don't know where, where many of you guys are this morning in your relationship with God. But I think we need to just check up back in our lives and see, what is it that's keeping us away from God? Is the difficulty that you're going through, maybe because it's not part of your plan, is that what is withholding you in your relationship with God? Is the difficulty that you're going through now? Maybe with your spouse, with your children. Is that what's withholding you back? Guys, we put our trust in so many other things. Even as we're sitting here this morning, we're putting our trust on these chairs. Trusting that it will not fail us. Trusting that it will not break. I saw a video of Fusi doing the bungee jumping. I don't think I would ever be able to do that. But he threw himself off there with a big smile on the face. And he trusted in that rope. He trusted that he's not going to be smashed at the bottom. And just like that, the way we trust, uh, we trust earthly things. We trust our lives with earthly things, whether it's our, our cars, our, we've got some pilots here. We trust our instruments, right? We trust the brakes in our car. You drive at 120 kilometers an hour. What do you think is going to happen if your brakes fail? But we put our trust in it. We know that if we put our foot on the brakes, it's going to slow down, right? And there will be no harm. In that same way that we trust earthly creations, our cars, our chairs, our whatever it is that you're working with daily, in the same way we need to put our trust in Jesus. We have to. And yes, sometimes we do stumble a little bit. But as long as we get up and we put our eyes on Jesus again. Maybe there's some of you this morning that hasn't cried out to God for your salvation. And this morning, I really want you guys to think about it. Maybe some of you have lost your way a little bit. Maybe it's time that you, that you reconnect yourself to all of these promises that God has given us. Maybe you should call out to the Lord again. 
And I want to end with this. Jesus, God the Father, loves us. All of what he's done so far in your life is because he loves you. And there's no way that because of what we've seen and experienced and have heard that we can doubt that. That's why when I started, I encourage you, the, the miracles and the, the testimonies, let's start sharing that with people so that people know that the story is, is truly the truth and that God is going to look after us. He's done it in the past and he's done it yesterday, today. Because that's what the Bible says. It says he's the same Lord yesterday, today and forever. And we need to put our trust in him. God has got a plan for us. In the same way he had this plan for salvation for us. All we need to do is we need to call out to him and we will be saved. Put our trust in him. Amen.